I, I want to chart a new course with you guys this morning, okay, for the year ahead. And I want to start kind of a new series, okay, uh, a, a new theme for the year. I say kind of because, look, as I just said before, God might switch things up. I might not stay on this topic every single, you know, Sunday, but, um, but this is going to be somewhat of a guiding theme for us going into the spring, okay, for the next few weeks or, or months. Um, so it's called The Culture of Grace is this uh, series I want to begin. And um, I, what this is about is, is maturity. This is about um, us going deeper together as a community, okay? I think we're finally kind of settling into 2019 a little bit. Are you? Kind of? Are you still writing 18 on dates and stuff? Still making those mistakes? That's all right. We're, we're in 2019, whether we like it or not. And, um, and I, I, think it's, I think it's a good time right about now to begin to set sail a little bit further, okay? And begin to think on some things that, um, that have to do with growing and maturing as a body and going further and deeper than we've gone before, Okay? So that's, that's what this is about. The culture of grace is basically um, us asking the question for ourselves, what does a community of grace look like? I mean, what does it really look like? What does an environment of grace smell like? Okay, what does it taste like? What does it feel like? What, what I mean, I want to get down in the dirt with you guys, this, this, for this whole thing, for, for the culture of grace. I want to like, I want to know how does grace manifest, really manifest in marriage, okay? In parenting, in the workplace, in the boardroom, in the workshop, okay? When you're doing errands, like we use this word a lot, grace, all the time. We're a grace church and um, we've taught now forwards and backwards through the Bible on the grace of God as revealed in the finished work of Jesus Christ, right? We have just covered a lot of it. And it's not like we haven't talked about like some of these life issues before we have, but, um, but I feel like the Lord wants us to go deeper. We've talked a lot in general terms, very spiritual terms on a Sunday morning, but I, I think God just wants to connect some dots for us more so that this is beyond just, just a moment in time where we sit down and we, we sing songs and we, we listen to a message. This is, this is something that's beginning to uh, shift and, uh, and, and illuminate our entire lives down to the details, down into the dirt, okay? I'm excited about going here with you, all right? And I hope you guys are too. For some of us, there's... There's fear in getting into these kind of things because we, we kind of, we, we're kind of afraid of, um, I'll say it this way, we, we want fellowship, but we're afraid of fellowship, koinonia fellowship. You guys familiar with the term koinonia? Anybody familiar with that word? It's from the Bible. It's, it's the Greek word where we get fellowship from. Koinonia is this amazing very textured, multi-layered word. It is a powder keg um, when you study just the word for fellowship in the Bible. It's also translated as communion um, and sharing. But at the root of it, this word koinonia has to do with sharing your heart and your life with a community. That's, in, that's intense. I mean, that's why we use it for communion because we're literally sharing Jesus's body and blood. I mean, you're communing with him. You're, 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 you're fellowshipping with Jesus in the most intimate, deep way possible. And Jesus said over the communion table, this is what you're going to partake in as a body, all of you together. This is what it means to be my, my follower, my followers. And so that can be scary. I mean, we like fellowship if it means, you know, talking over bagels and donuts every once in a while or something, you know, and having our nice greeting time, but, but koinonia, fellowship, that's, that's like a whole other side of the pool. That's a little bit in the deeper end. And, 
And so here, here's what I want um, right now, what I, what I want to ask of you, okay? If you want to go into those deeper waters with the Lord, whether you feel like you can or you're afraid or you, you have struggles, you have questions or whatever, but there's a yes in your heart. There's a yes in you to go deeper and for the grace of God to pull you into this dimension of Christianity that he has intended for us from the beginning. If, if there's at least a flicker of a yes in your heart, I want you to stand up. Okay, I want you to stand up and I want to pray for you. Okay, you don't have to stand up. You don't have to. It's okay. How about every eye closed so nobody's embarrassed if they want to, they're not ready. All right? And if you don't know what you're saying yes to, then just, you're, just stand. <laughs> um, let's, no, really, close your eyes. Father, right now, I just ask that you would mark our hearts with the spirit of love. Everyone, Lord, everyone in this room, whether they're standing or not, Jesus, I pray for your love to invade. I pray for your love to invade. I pray for fears to get melted. I pray, Lord, that you would call us deeper, Lord. I thank you for those who are saying yes to this call, Jesus. We just stand together as a church, and we, we ask you, Lord, to take us deeper into true fellowship with you, true freedom, that you would take us into a culture of your kingdom. Take us out of head knowledge, Jesus, into lifestyle, into a complete reorientation of how we see life, how we see ourselves and one another. Jesus, we just commit this to you in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Thank you. Okay, I want to deal with a misconception first about this topic, okay? Because I think there's people out there and maybe people in this church who, who might hear the phrase, uh, culture of grace, and they think that that means it's t we're talking about a church that doesn't um, judge sin, okay? That's like maybe something that comes to mind. It's like people think this means we're, we're, we're like really super nice to each other, and we don't deal with sin and problems in any kind of confrontational, strong way because that would be judgmental, right? That would be religious, as we say, um, I want you to know that that is not a culture of grace. That's actually a culture of fear pretending to be grace, okay? So you have to understand something about the word judgment as we get into this, okay? And I've talked about this many times, but for those who haven't heard this teaching before or maybe not this focused, I hope this is a help to you. But the word judgment in the Hebrew language that it was written in the Bible is very different than what comes to your minds when you hear judgment, when our society hears judgment, okay? There are passages in the Bible, like in Psalm 35, where the psalmist is crying out to God and says, God, judge me according to your righteousness. Why in the world would you pray, God, judge me, unless you have a different understanding of that word than our society has? That word for judge in the, he in the Hebrew language really just means correct, heal, strengthen. So it's a really good thing. So when we pray for the judgment of God, really what we should be expecting and, and should be in our minds is for God to come and bring healing and correction. When you go to a doctor for surgery, that doctor is enacting a judgment upon a virus or a, or a mass or something that should not be there. The judgment is not on you. You understand this? You guys with me? The judgment is not on you. The judgment is on anything that is hurting you, hurting your life. And there is fierce and fiery judgment on anything that robs, steals, and kills from God's kids. There is. But the judgment isn't on you. Just take a breath right now. You are loved. There is absolutely no ill will from God towards you. I don't care what you're involved with. I don't care what you're walking out of this room doing in your life. God is in love with you, like head over heels wild, like I could get really drunk right now as I preach thinking about it. Jesus, <laughs> he loves you so much. Oh, there is no condemnation. Okay, we have to understand this word judgment, okay? 
and a culture of grace is not a culture without judgment. There's judgment. But it is judgment unto healing, okay? So um, just want to get that clear. You guys still with me? All right? Okay. Um, here's the best way I thought maybe I could start this journey off for the next however long we begin talking about these things. I want to put up a chart, and I want to talk about some of the differences between a religious culture and a grace culture. Okay, religious cultures take judgment in the wrong way. And that's unfortunately why a lot of people don't understand the word judgment and why they feel judged by the church and all it causes all these problems because they're used to a religious environment, a religious culture. Okay, we're talking about an environment of how we live life when we use the word culture. Okay, does, does that make sense, this word culture? It's, it's, um, it's, it has to do with everything, like every interaction we have, every, um, every uh, communication, every way that we live, that we think, that we process information. It's like, you know, the fishbowl example, like the fish isn't aware of the water that he's in. It's like us with the air. You don't just, you know, you're not just constantly thinking about hydrogen and, and carbon, you know, dioxide. I almost said monoxide. That wouldn't be good. You're not thinking about all this carbon dioxide that's around you, right? But it's there, right? The culture's kind of like that. Like the culture is, um, is just surrounding us and it's a part of our lives. So, so there's a religious culture that infects and fills a lot of churches and a lot of what people think of as church. But there is a culture of grace, which you could also say a culture of the kingdom, that is completely different and is awesome. And that's what we want to go for. So I thought it might be helpful for us to like delineate between the two things, okay? Okay, you guys, that, all right, nod, the head nod would be helpful right there. Yep, yep, I see Isaiah nodding at me. He gave me a wink. Mm hmm. Okay. So let's, uh, let's, let's look at this. Is this working? Just go to the next slide there. Okay. Go to the next one. So a religious culture wants to protect the rules while a grace culture wants to protect relationship. Oh, this is going to be good. Somebody say this is going to it's going to be real good. Okay. So there's a book here I want to recommend to everybody in this church. It's called Culture of Honor. Uh, we're going to be going over it just as a leadership team. Um, it's by a guy named Danny Silk from out in uh, Redding, California, Bethel Church. And um, we're going to be borrowing a lot from this book. I'm going to be using a lot from this book uh, as we go through uh, this whole theme of the culture of grace. But this is called Culture of Honor, and um, I'm, I'm borrowing a little bit when we talk about rules and relationship from a chapter he has in there. Um, so let's get into this, okay? Rules versus relationship. Um, any religious culture, whether it's a cult or even a mainline church that has a lot of control uh, in it, um, even secular social clubs, I mean, even families can have, you know, there's, there's families that are, that are filled with religiosity. The focus is on the rules, okay? The focus is on what's right, what's wrong, and the reason for that always comes down to one thing. It comes down to fear. It's all fear-driven. We fear getting hurt, so we want to control outcomes, we want to control things so we don't get hurt or other people don't get hurt. And so we create rules, right? And, um, and then we enforce those rules and we, you have to make sure the enforcement of those rules is so strong that you can maintain a sense of power and which gives you a sense of security, which eliminates that fear that drives your life all the time, right? So we rally around rules, we rally around the right and the wrong and the enforcement of those rules, which is where punishment and bad kind of judgment comes in. And, um, and look, rules are good. Like, I want to make some things clear here. And they might start off good in a community or something, but what happens is soon we start focusing on rules more than we focus on people's faces. Everybody smile. 
All those smiling faces. You guys, look, everybody look at this side. You guys look at this side. You guys look at this. See the faces right here. You guys look at each other right now for a moment. Go ahead. Look to the left. Look to the right. See each other's faces for a moment. Come on. I'm pushing you out in deeper water here. Yeah. People. Wow. Real human beings who are just as stressed as you are. <laughs> yeah. Struggling with things just as much as you are. Some more. Um, so we, we forget people's faces and we start just seeing the rules. And when those, when, when those people, which aren't totally people in our minds, start breaking the rules, the rules become the thing we need to protect instead of the person who has actually broken the rule. And here's what happens. Eventually, always, eventually, because when we're driven by fear, we want to, you know, we, we need to protect more and more uh, from anything bad happening. We start creating rules around the rules. We start creating rules to protect rules. And then we create rules to protect the rules that protect the rules. You have to go no further than New Jersey legislation right now to uh, understand this. Um, but I'm going to keep things non-political, and I'm going to talk about 2,000 years ago when Jesus showed up on earth, okay? Um, when Jesus showed up on earth, man, they had much worse legislation than we do now, trust me. Jesus showed up in a time period where um, you, had, you had Roman legal rules, but then you had the Jewish Hebraic rules, right? And they had gotten so uptight about their rules that they created sub-rules and points A, B, C, D, E, I, 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 X, all of that, right? So the obvious one that you'll hear quoted a lot is the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a big one. Sabbath started out very simple, okay? Let me explain the Sabbath to you. God is creating mankind to enjoy life, to work, to fulfill your destiny and purpose. And he says to them, remember to take a break. Remember to relax. Remember to enjoy life. Remember to take time for family. Remember to process, to reflect, to celebrate, okay? And uh, because workaholism is going to be on your backs. So, so remember, take time off, okay? Beautiful rule, so to speak, but it was more of a life principle. Now, what happened was in Jesus' day with the religious leadership of the time, they took that rule and they turned it into a burden. And they said, they started to parse out what exactly is resting, what is Sabbath, what is not Sabbath. And so they had these little crazy rules of like, you know, if you so much as plucked a grain of, of wheat off of, a, off of a stalk in a field, you were breaking the Sabbath, thus you should be punished and be an outcast, right? You, if you did just the littlest amount of work, Whatever it was on a Saturday, you know, you would be shunned. It was a problem. And they just kept building this up. Now, they had good reason to do this, okay? It's easy to point the finger, but they had this prophet, Jeremiah, from hundreds of years prior, who told the people when they got sacked by Babylon, Jerusalem got destroyed, Jeremiah rose up and said, you never practice the Sabbath, and so you're going to be in exile for every year you didn't practice the Sabbath, 70 years. So that's pretty intense. But obviously, Jeremiah wasn't just saying you broke this rule, you weren't taking a day off, and now God's punishing the city. He was really saying to them, this is the fruit of your labor. You decided to take your life into your own hands. You decided to never rest, never trust, and that will always lead to things overtaking your life and you going into exile from your purpose. If you feel exiled from your purpose this morning, I want to encourage you to schedule rest into your life, and you will find yourself coming home. That was for free. I'm going to keep going. So Jeremiah says, this is a problem, right? And there are all this, all this horrible stuff happens to Jerusalem because they didn't practice a lifestyle of rest. So the religious leadership hundreds of years later Hi, guys. Welcome. Come on. Take a seat. Take a seat. The religious leadership comes in and says, okay, we need to make sure that never happens again. So we're going to create rule after rule after rule to protect us from getting sacked again by Babylon. All right? You guys with me? So 
Jesus shows up on the scene and he starts like pushing the boundaries a little bit, like pushing the rules and, and, um, and he makes this statement. He says to them, at one time, he rebukes the religious leadership of the day and he says to them, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. Who remembers this statement from Jesus? Okay. The Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. What is he saying there? What's, what's, what's he saying? What's the... Yeah. 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 The Sabbath, the, the, I forget which commandment it is. It's like, what, the second or third commandment? The Sabbath is meant to be a blessing to you. You weren't made for the Sabbath, this rule, right? It's an incredible statement that Jesus makes. Now, this gets into the next point. Everybody look up on the screen. Is this working yet? There we go. A religious culture, we're, we're, we're separating between religion and grace. A religious culture focuses on the what. A grace culture focuses on the why. Now, I, I can probably... Um, this is what Jesus did, by the way. He explained the why of the Sabbath. He explained that man, man has this need for rest, for trust, for, and, and the Sabbath provides that. He gave the why. He didn't just come in and say, this is the command, obey it. He gave the reason. There's a reason you should embrace Sabbath in your life. There's a purpose for it, and it's for your good. Okay? This isn't me coming in trying to control your schedule and beat you over the head if you don't take Sunday off, right? Different culture, different environment. Religious culture, if people don't show up at church, there's this judgment. There's this like, you know, what's, what's going on in their life? I want to, you know, pounce on them. Anyway, the best way that I could try to separate the what and the why here is by talking about the state of youth ministry in churches across America right now. Um, there is this alarming statistic that has not changed um, for, I don't know, maybe decades now, where kids grow up in church and they go through their youth ministry, they go up through Sunday school and they go through, you know, junior high programs and high school programs. And then when they hit college, 70% or so, seven out of every 10 kids leaves the faith. Like just they, they, they hit college and it's just, it's, it's gone. There's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons all across the aisle, a lot of factors. But if I could propose to you, one of the deepest factors is that kids in a lot of Christian education, American Christian education, they are told the what more than they're told the why. What I mean is that they're told what to believe, they're told what to do, right and wrong, Bible says this, Bible says to do that, don't do this, don't do that. But they're not given the underlying reasons, the deeper purposes behind why those things are in place. And so it never takes root, it never becomes theirs. They never take ownership of it. There was never a heart connection with the teaching. You guys still tracking on this? So this is where I share my story of a PTA meeting. I went to a parent-teacher association meeting. I got asked to go because I am on the board for CASA, which is a drug organization in town, drug fighting organization, um, not a cartel. It's uh, against drugs. Um, and... Uh, and so I got to go represent. Aren't I a great representative for this, this group? So I got to go represent um, at a local elementary school. And um, the elementary school happened to be my daughter Annabelle's elementary school for their PTA meeting. So I was like, good, I get to kill two birds with one stone on this. I can go and, and be involved and meet the teachers and I can share a little bit about CASA. So, um, so I did that. It was good. And then because I was there as a parent, I did the presentation in the beginning and then I stayed for the whole meeting. And... Um, and there was this one part where one of the teachers got up, I think of the first and second grade classes, and they were giving an update on new ways that they're teaching spelling. These were English, well, I guess not English, I guess the teachers in elementary school teach multiple subjects, right? But they were talking about spelling and reading. 
And um, they were just giving the parents a heads up. And they were saying, look, you're not going to see as much memorization come home of like your spelling lists from here on out. We're not just having the kids memorize words. We're going to start sending them home pieces of words and teaching them how to put those words together so they can learn the underlying skills that can come together and be used for any vocabulary that comes before them. They're giving them the nuts and bolts of words more than just telling them to remember the words. And this was a little hard for some parents to process, I could tell by the feedback. But I walked out of that meeting and I was like, this is awesome. There's like a deep principle behind this. This is a great movement in education. It's nice to be able to say something like that. So what I liked about that was that we're teaching kids how to do things, the why behind the very structure of words, instead of just giving them things to memorize. So what happens is kids go home and they get their list of like 15 words and they memorize the words and they, they pass the test and they really didn't learn anything. I mean, they just, I, they learned some words maybe, but a lot of it fades out of their, their consciousness within a week when they get the new list. Anyway, there's a quote in Culture of Honor. I'm going to put this up on the screen that speaks to this beautifully. It says this. It's by this guy, Roger Lewin. He was a scientist. It says, too often we give children answers to remember instead of problems to solve. I'll let you just sit on that one. Too often we give children answers to remember instead of problems to solve. Um... Translate this now to church life. Translate this to the culture of Christianity and how we begin to teach people about purity, sexual purity, or money, managing money, or church attendance, Sabbath, and all that kind of stuff, right? Are we giving people to-dos? Are we giving people lists? Are we giving people these commandments to follow? Or are we teaching them the underlying reasons behind why God established these things and why it's important and why this stuff actually enhances joy and peace in your life instead of destruction, which all these other things do. I just, I, I want to continue to make this loud and clear. We weren't made to live according to rules, okay? We were made to be free, to live life with this strong sense of spontaneity and abundance, but that said, freedom is not a free-for-all, right? Freedom has structure to it. Everybody say structure. It's a wide and it's a spacious structure, but there are boundaries that you shouldn't cross. And so a grace culture helps understand those boundaries, but it does so by honoring relationship, by honoring the person, okay? Okay. Here's the last distinction for today. A religious culture focuses on retribution. A grace culture focuses on rehabilitation. So there was a time that Jesus broke the rules. There's this very strong rule in the Old Testament, Law of Moses, that says if a woman is caught in adultery and the sin is confirmed by two or three witnesses, she's to be stoned. It's like there's no, there's no interpretive wiggle room. There's no like, it's just Moses said it. And this is before the New Testament, right? Jeez, they, they didn't write it yet. This is their Bible. This is what they would have under their seats and give to their welcome packet on their synagogue Sundays, Saturdays. <laughs> it's their Bible. No wiggle room. Stoned. Two or three witnesses, right? Okay, so you guys know where I'm going with this. What happens? Woman gets caught in the act of adultery. These Jewish leaders bring her to Jesus because they want to see him break the law so that they can have ammunition against him. There's no arguing with Moses here, right? And Jesus is so brilliant the way that he handles this, right? I love it. I love it. He doesn't necessarily break the law, but let's be real. He's coming against it. He is absolutely coming against what Moses said. In the black and white letter of the law, Jesus is going against something in the Bible. I don't know how you deal with that, but I'm just throwing that out there for you. And he says to everyone there, he who is without sin, why don't you throw a, a rock at this woman? 
Go ahead, pick up a stone and throw a rock at her if you're free from sin. Man. Oh, that's a heavy statement, right? Now, you know, we love that story. We do. We love this story of just freedom and and grace and liberation, but I gotta gotta get in the dirt with you guys a little bit. I gotta like, this is where I wanna get it in the nitty gritty, okay? We, we, We always demonize these Pharisees, these religious leaders, and, um, and we like, yeah, I'm glad Jesus fought for this woman, but okay, let's just remember something. She was sleeping with another woman's husband. And I want you to think about that other woman. Okay, that other woman probably wanted some justice. Okay, I had an experience in a, my first long relationship in high school where I was cheated on and I experienced this like dagger in the stomach of being cheated on. It was one of the worst feelings I've ever experienced. You know, plus I'm a, I'm a hormone crazy teenager that's, you know, thinks has found the love of his life. And, you know, that just c- complicates things, but doesn't matter. It's still painful. It's still this horrible thing, right? So I know, you know, a, a little bit, you know, of the anger that can, that can rise up from an experience like this. So let's just, let's just think about that for a moment, okay? I want to think about this other woman involved in this situation because I'm sure she might want some form of punishment. Um, we're getting in real life nitty-gritty stuff here now because you've all experienced offense in your life. You've all encountered this kind of stuff. And um, we get offended by sin. I mean, anybody because it's an offense, right? That person is an offender. What do we do to offenders? We lock up offenders, right? But Jesus, in this case, he cares just as much about the offender. He cares about this woman's heart, her life, more than just the offense, more than just the broken rule. Because he sees who she is. He sees potential in her life. He sees to who God really made her to be. And, um, and so he doesn't inflict punishment. And this is where we get into the offensive, wild part of the culture of grace. If this was easy, then all the churches on the country would be living up the culture of grace. This stuff is not easy because a culture of grace protects the offended and the offender. Jesus died for both, right? We want to see the offenders strung up. So grace comes in. It never adds to the offender's guilt because that's just putting more gasoline on the wickedness of this world. But remember something else for anybody who thinks I'm like proposing like, okay, so adultery's fine. You know, if you think I'm preaching that, you're not hearing me, okay? And you haven't, you haven't heard me if that's what you walk away with. Jesus looks to this woman And he says to her very clearly, what does he say? Go and sin no more. Right? He's speaking, I believe, to her identity. He's not excusing the sin. He calls it what it is. He's not afraid to use the word sin. There's some, quote, grace churches that are afraid to talk about sin. Okay? Sin is a problem. It is a disease. It is a virus killing people. I'm not going to be afraid to talk about that word. Jesus used that word, but he released forgiveness and he restored this woman to her identity and basically said to her, now live according to who you are. Live according to who you are. Adultery is not who you are. It's not what you were made for. It's not healthy. It's going to destroy your life. Get up and move forward. So he focused on the person above the rule and the why even above just the what. And then he rehabilitated her. He began to lead her into restoration instead of retribution and punishment. You guys still tracking along with me? Yeah, amen? You guys good? So in the book, Culture of Honor, um, I'm gonna kind of close with this. He tells this really difficult story, really hopeful but tough story situation he was in as a pastor where this guy, uh, Danny Silk, he was, he was uh, pastoring a church and a pastor from another church reached out to him. 
and said, man, I have got a problem. Um, I need some counsel. I need your help. He said, my uh, worship pastor, the worship leader of our church, just committed adultery, just had an affair. And um, we have a large church, and it's just, it's, this is just crazy because this guy is so anointed and doing so well, and, and then I just found this out. So he's like, would you mind maybe having a meeting with this, this, this man and his wife? So he calls a meeting with this worship pastor. This is a true story. Okay, they, they, they come into the room. He said, the, the guy just came in like a dog that just got chewed out, like, you know, just tail between his legs and absolutely heartbroken his life. You know, he, he, he has this hanging over him, like the, the, the shoe's about to drop. Punishment is about to be released upon him. He'll never, you know, lead worship again. His family's gonna fall. I mean, he's just got the stones. He's ready. He's ready for these things to come at him. So he sits down with this guy, Danny Silk, who wrote this book, Culture of Honor. And the, uh, the other pastor's there, and this couple is there, you know, obviously this, this, this tension between them. And this guy's just dejected. And Danny Silk, as he's talking to them, he says to them both, uh, what's the problem? And, and, and the guy, and the guy uh, looks up and says, well, I... I, I cheated on my wife. Like, you know, he goes into everything. He's like, yeah, I know. I know, but what's the problem? And um, the guy just looks like, is this guy like getting ready to slap me on the face or something? Like, what, what is this guy trying to do to here? Like, I, we know what the problem is. You know, what I, what I did. And, and the guy's like, I, I, I don't know. And so the, Danny Silk asked the question a third time. Guys, what is, what is the problem? Finally, you know, he realizes they're going to need a little bit of help with this. So he says to him, what would drive a man to ruin his relationship with his wife, his relationship with his church, and his peace with God? What, what, what drives a man to do that? And the guy is like, I don't know. He's just still kind of quiet and, you know, just enclosed and wrapped up in the guilt, and um, Danny still starts fishing around because he's interested in the person. He's interested in the relationship here. So through a series of questions, he eventually asks, like, okay, there's obviously issues in the marriage. How is your relationship? Tell me about your relationship. He discovers this little fact about their love language. The woman, the wife, her love language is words of affirmation. Everybody familiar with love languages? Five love languages? Okay, read the book if you haven't read that. It's really good. Um, even if you're not married, it's a wonderful book about relationships. So he asked her, what's your love language? And her love language is words of affirmation. She loves to be told, I love you, affirmed, um, all that kind of stuff. And she says, he never affirms me. He never, you know, she says, you know, he's never once said I love you. So he looks at the guy. Now, this was a really like, Big church, like powerful worship ministry. And he says, okay, so you're telling me you lead people every Sunday to tell God you love him. You're pouring words of affirmation on God and you can't tell your wife, you can't squeak out and I love you to your wife? What's going on? Now, the guy's still confused, just like you guys probably are right now. It's like, okay, where, where are you going with this? And, and, and so they, were, they reached an impasse in the conversation and Danny Silk begins to ask the Lord, like, help me here. What's going on? Like, Jesus, you know, give me some revelation, some wisdom. And in, as they are just kind of sitting there, he just gets this inspiration to ask a certain question. And, um, and it leads him to the dynamics between this man and his father and how his father never once told him I loved him, couldn't express emotion to him, never taught him what it's like to give words of affirmation. And, um, and so he asked this question. This was the inspiration. He says, are you telling me that you can only love that which is perfect? And the, that, the guy didn't understand what he meant by that. And he said, okay, I'll ask it in a different way. Are you telling me that you can only love something like God where you feel there's no risk of getting hurt. And at that moment, the guy just started sobbing. He broke down and he realized like, I have become just like my dad. 
And it was like the lights turned on. I'm not going to, I got to, I got to wrap this up here, but there's a little bit more as they go through this and they pray for forgiveness towards his dad that this healing begins to manifest. I mean, just a beautiful story of how this works out. And this guy repents, like genuinely repents. And so the pastor comes up to Danny Silk later and they still want to, you know, they still have to inflict certain consequences and everything, but, but they realize like, okay, we don't have to punish this guy in the way that we originally thought. We have to protect his heart and his wife's heart. We have to work with them. We have to, we have to just get in the dirt with them and help them move forward. This guy is back to leading worship. His marriage is in this amazing place great relationship with his kids. He gets home from that meeting and he gave his kids the biggest hug he'd ever given them and told them for the first time how much he loved them because God's light broke through into the person. It's a powerful story and I'm only giving you like the highlights of it, but there's more to it than that. My point in bringing this up for you, it's kind of like a teaser trailer of where we're going. Like how do we deal with ourselves and with one another? How do we deal with life? You know, how do we deal with stuff from the right way, from the Jesus way? I don't want one ounce of a religious culture in our midst as we move forward, as we seek to reach people who are stuck in addiction and, and all kinds of stuff, as we're looking to like expand out all of that, we better get this. We better ask the Lord to just touch our hearts so I want to leave you guys with some questions, okay? And I'm just going to pray. We're just going to close it, all right? No, we won't close with any music. I want, to just, I want to just pray for you, but I want to leave you with this question. How, how do you respond to offense? Obviously, how do you respond to, you know, your own offense? But I mean, how do you respond to offenders on the 7 o'clock news? I just go right for the gut. That's why I asked that question. How do you respond to, uh, to any kind of darkness? Do you immediately want to jump in and control the situation? Do you go, do you jump to punishment as your first resort? Or are you growing in, in, in going to Jesus in everything, in every offense? Are you growing in asking for his heart, asking for his solutions, focusing on the person? This is tough stuff, guys, but guess what? We have a very strong father who will take us by the hand and lead us into this as a community. So let's, let's stand up again. All right, let me pray for you.